Hello and welcome to Marathon Swim Stories, where we hear the human side of the superhuman feats of endurance swimmers and those who support them. I'm marathon swimmer and coach, Shannon Keegan. After my interview today with the esteemed Ned Dennison, I realized that I forgot to ask a few questions. One of my favorites, who's inspired Ned? Following up by email, he sent me a list almost as long as his swimming resume. And why does he keep going? Ned's a goal setter. It gets me out of bed in the morning and I sleep better, he says. And it seems that if you run out of known goals, you make up your own. Be sure to look up Marathon Centurion or Extraordinary Marathon Century Club whose ranks Ned aspires. When you have a four-page swim resume like Ned, it's hard to know where to start. So we started, like we do with every guest on Marathon Swim Stories, at the beginning, and had time for a couple of his stories. Well, more than a couple. I can't wait to have Ned back to dig into his many contributions to the sport. I hope you enjoy this episode. All right. All right, Ned, what's your story? What's my story? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I, I grew up swimming. Um, we didn't have uh, really competitive swimming in the state of Vermont. Uh, there was one high school with a swimming pool and it wasn't mine. So I was probably competitive in a 20 yard pool from age 10 to 12, uh, but spent the summer swimming. Uh, played water polo for a couple of decades and started open water swimming in 2000 when I was living in Northern California. Uh, my, my big kind of swim was Alcatraz uh, that, that summer. And um, I think I spent the entire time with the kayakers going that way, that way, <laughs> that way, that way. So I went back the next year. Um, and it's, this was the South End Rowing Club, 700 people on the boat. The first year I was the last person off the boat because I didn't want to be milling around with 80% wetsuiters when I was in my Speedo. The next year I I recognized one of the guys who had taken a podium position. So he went to get a coffee. I went to get a coffee. He put on his Speedo left leg first. I put on my Speedo left leg first. (laughs) He went to the toilet. And at that point he got kind of nervous because I was falling (laughs) around. Um, He he jumped off the boat, um, swam up to the start line and broke. And I just, I just stood, stayed on his feet for as long as I could. And uh, so he set the line and there was a boat in front of him. Um, and then I, I kind of figured out there's, there's a different way to sight, which is uh, getting back to somebody that knows what they're doing. Then I moved <laughs> to Ireland uh, about 20 years ago and I've been swimming here ever since. Um, I'm uh, either fortunate or clever. I live right by the water and uh, I get to swim at Sandy Cove Island most days. Uh, last month, I completed my 2,500th lifetime lap, and I've done, at this point, 55 kind of what I call epic marathons of 10, 10 to 60K. So so I can call any, anything over 10K you call epic? <laughs> Well, I, I don't, I don't count, um, you know, going around the island seven times as epic. I don't okay. count going, you know, back and forth in Dover Harbor, uh, between the walls, uh, an epic marathon. But okay. if you're going point to point, uh, over and back around something, yeah, yeah, I think it's, I think it's an epic marathon. <laughs> okay, I hear you use that that term, so I wanted to make sure I could understand how I could count my own epic swims. <laughs> <laughs> there is there is a there is a bucket list um, which uh, I created, which is my goal, which is to do 100 of these in my lifetime. Um, there's a X number have to be over 25 K over 10 miles, et cetera, et cetera. And you can't have more than eight repeats. Nice. I love so that. I, I'm, at, I'm, I'm at 55 now and I have loads of time. <laughs> I'll put the link in the chat for, for folks so they can check that out. The Extraordinary Marathon Century Club. It's an awesome goal. <laughs> Tell me, going back to going back to Vermont, how did you go into how did you get into water polo if you were just doing 20 yard summer club? <laughs> I, I, I went to university and they had a water polo club. And um, it was kind of across from the residence where I was living. And um, I, I, I wasn't particularly skillful at sports, but I was a goalkeeper at anything. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I reckon I could probably stop a bullet. Um, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't particularly a good swimmer or anything like that, but I was a reasonable goalkeeper. Good deal. Good deal. Do you find it any, when you started open water swimming, did you find any, I, I played a little bit of water polo, just club in college. Did you find any carryovers to open water swimming, having had some experience playing water polo? Oh yeah. So the, the, well, the, the first thing is, is that, you, you know, you're not necessarily swimming between lane lines. Right. The second thing is you can, you can pick your head up. The third thing is water polo players have five, 10, 50 different strokes. Whereas a swimmer probably has, you know, one stroke for a 50, one stroke for a hundred, one stroke for 200. Um, and then the final thing is um, I'm kind of six, five, six, six, um, weigh the better part of a hundred kilograms. I'm a reasonably big guy in the water. So um, on these mass starts, I have no <laughs> problem at all. Um, I, I, I give as good as I get. We did a swim in uh, Catechus in Spain last year. There were 800 people. And I was right up in the front and my goggles kicked off a couple of times. I deserved each one of them, um, <laughs> but uh, th there was nobody in a wetsuit that was moving me off my line. As, as anybody who's watched water polo and it, since it's become part of the Olympics would understand <laughs> how, how you can keep your spot. got it. <laughs> Some of your viewers will know a guy named Finbar Hederman, who's quite a, quite a large guy. And uh, he and I were at a mass start a uh, couple of years ago. And, uh, I think we're the only couple in wetsuits and it was a big crowd at the front and he's a very tall, big guy. So in my best American exit in Ireland, I said, so, so Finbar, how does it work here? Do we have to wait for the start before we start hitting the guys in the wetsuits? And all of a sudden, <laughs> magically, a little bit of space opened up for us uh, before the start. <laughs> the other thing, I guess, um, <laughs> I've noticed about just having come from water polo to open water swimming is that you I think I feel like you're more aware of what's going on the water outside the water you know because you're because you're used to playing heads up you want to know where the ball is and so all of a sudden you know yeah. in open water you're like what's you know what's going on my crew where's my boat you know you're not just like you don't get to the zone maybe the same way <laughs> yeah that's so cool that's quite an impressive background though so you're actually an all-american and a goalie in university? I was, I was seven time All American in university. And um, they used to have indoor and outdoor championships. It was kind of a strange concept. In the West Coast, it was outdoor, and the East Coast, it was indoor. And I played for an incredible number of clubs in, in my time for some reason. I'm not sure why. Every now and then I get a call <laughs> and say, Come on, Ned, come play with us. And I go, Fine. The size. I think you're the size. <laughs> <laughs> so you went from Vermont to California and then somehow ended up in Ireland. How'd you end up in Ireland? I married a woman with three children and uh, it was part of the deal. Um, <laughs> that didn't, uh, didn't uh, last the course, but I, uh, I liked the country and I liked the people and I liked uh, where I was. So I decided to stay. <laughs> but along, uh, be between Vermont and, and California, I lived in a number of different places I went to 44 countries on business and I've probably been to almost 70 countries all told. So I've, I've traveled. Yeah. Yeah. But Ireland's where, where it's at. Yeah. <laughs> Elaine Howley really wanted me to know that. Why, why, they, why haven't they kicked you out yet? <laughs> I, I have a, um, I have a British passport, which until uh, two weeks ago gave me the right to live in Ireland. Uh, with the, the, the Brexit happening, that's a, a tiny bit in flux, but there are a couple of million retired English people living in Spain. They're not going anywhere soon. And England and Ireland have always had a, a kind of an open border. So I, I, I don't really think with a clear criminal record and having paid taxes in Ireland, they're going to throw me out first. Got it. So um, you start doing open water swimming. When did you start pushing distance to marathon distances? Um, when I came to um, Ireland, um, I, I had never done more than sort of a couple of miles. Um, uh, didn't really have the opportunity, didn't know of anything like that. And in, in Ireland, we were swimming around the island. If you did two laps, that was 3K. That was a big deal. And I noticed there was a six mile swim to this little island off the coast. I contacted the organizer and he said, well, okay. He said, you missed it for this year, but there's, um, there's one coming up next year. I'll put you on the list. I said, great. He said, oh, by the way, we're organizing 
five, we're organizing a number of relay teams from people from Ireland to swim the English Channel. We hope to set some sort of record for the most number of teams. And they said, well, that sounds like interesting. Put me on the list for that. And then I organized a conference call with a bunch of my colleagues with him and 12 signed up. And the more I heard about the relay, the more a solo sounded like an easier gig. <laughs> you didn't have to get in and out. You didn't have to throw up on the boat. Um, so I, uh, I moved from the relay to the solo. And b- before the six mile swim. <laughs> oh yeah. Before the six mile swim. Um, and, and back in those days, Sally will remember, um, I, I literally mentioned to a friend of mine at the pool one day, I was thinking about it. He said he had attempted years ago, but it had been weathered out. So that night we both called and both booked for the following summer. This was about September. <laughs> wow. um, it, it's not quite as easy anymore. Um, mm-hmm. And literally my six hour swim was my longest swim before the English Channel attempt. Um, there weren't a lot of intermediate options back then. Now, when people call me up with a stupid plan like that, I say, whoa, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. There's a 5K here. There's a 10K over here. To do a 10K, you're probably going to have to learn about feeding. There's a 15K over here. You'll remember your childhood prayers. There's a 25K over here in, in calm, warmer water. Do that first, and you'll, you'll figure out when your arm freezes and all that kind of stuff. And then, after a couple of years, do the English Channel. Right. But, but, but back, back then, it was, it was not uncommon for people to just have a go. It still happens, but it's very rare. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The stakes are higher when you're booking two years out, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> or more. <laughs> but, I have to, I, but I have to say, Shannon, the, the, what are we now? We're, uh, we're January. There's probably somebody who has never done 5K who's calling around to pilots right now. And he's either going to be really lucky and get a first of June slot when it's a particularly cold <laughs> right. or a first of November slot or a seventh preference in August. And, yeah. you know, they, they may or may not be successful, but they won't have they won't have the, the best time uh, slot available to do their swim. Right. Yep. Yep. So how did you train for that first, that first English Channel Crossing, which became your first marathon? <laughs> so I, I had a, a, a local buddy who was doing the relay and we carpooled. And um, I'm a big fan of, of things like carpooling because when you don't want to go swimming and you know your buddies in the car on the way over, you, you get your swimsuit together and you, and, and you get ready. And if it's your job to pick him up and you know he got up early, you go pick him up. So swimming with a partner increases your likelihood of making it. We literally did laps of Sandy Cove Island. And back in those days, we didn't swim other than really high water. So we swam at a different place called Oyster Haven, which isn't as nice. And I set my goal that year to, to do 200 laps of Sandy Cove Island, which no one had come close to doing. And I remember distinctly going down between Christmas and New Year's, absolutely freezing and getting a, a lap in every day and finally completed it on the, uh, the last day of the year. Uh, we, we now have about 10 or 11, 12 people locally who have done more than 200 laps in a year. Um, and then from there, I, I, did a, I did a six hour training swim. Wow. We did, we did, I didn't know any better. Right. I, I, I have to confess, we, we did one 24-hour pool swim hmm. where we swam an hour every four hours, something like that, um, to give you, you know, some idea of what your body was going to go through. Right. But um, the, 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 the training and the, and the events and, the, and the, the weeks and the blogs and everything else is, is so much more advanced than it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Right, right, yeah. So, how did that first, how did that first channel crossing go? I uh, I failed miserably. Well, that's not that's probably not true. Um, I had heard all these stories about people who had been weathered out, and I said, I am getting wet. <laughs> that I'm getting wet, and the 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 boat guy said, Look, it you know it's going to be rough to start, but it's probably going to calm down. I said, We're there. I think three boats went out. Two of them quickly went back. It didn't get calmer. I went, uh, I went eight hours. 
we didn't know a lot about feeding. So we had a, uh, a three meter cord tied to a bottle in two meter swells, probably the best way to describe it. So I would come in, I'd grab the bottle, the boat would go up and twist <laughs> and the bottle would pop away. And then I could see the barnacles on the boat as it was coming back down. <laughs> so I, uh, I drank 1.1 liters in eight hours. <laughs> I had three friends who were my crew. One guy, we never saw him. He was sick the entire time. <laughs> One guy stood by the doorway of the boat about to be sick the entire time. And the third guy was a Swedish guy who had been a wit bred around the, row, around the world yachting navigator. And he didn't know anything about my swimming or the channel, um, but he hung in there. And at a certain point, he, he did this. I, I didn't really think, I don't really drink tea. <laughs> but it, it dawned on me that it was probably time to get out. And I do remember having trouble um, not swimming off to the left. And I was focusing very hard at not swimming down at a 45 degree angle. Um, I, I got in the boat under my own power, but um, it wasn't the uh, best experience. The only good thing about it is that everybody loves you after you don't finish. <laughs> you get more text messages. You get more people telling you how wonderful you are. And then I, I simply called again and booked another slot two months later and, and completed it. Okay. Again, you, you can't really do that anymore, but right, that's, that's right. what we do at the time. Yeah. What year was that again? It was 2005 and I completed on a very easy date to remember, um, 9-11, 11 September. Uh, oh. 2005. All right. And I was the I was the last uh, I was the was last the swimmer of, of the pilot that year. His name was Dave White. He's a Hall of Fame pilot. And, and, the, and the, the best thing he said to me is he said, look, he said, it may not matter to you, he said, but it matters to me. He says, the pilots have kind of a competition and I'm running a hundred percent success rate and you're my <laughs> last swimmer. I'd kind of like to finish the year that way. And he was an absolute gentleman. And um so that, that, you know, I, with that, when you, when you do the English channel, you, you join a special group. And as long as you keep swimming, you have a kind of a passport to swim. It doesn't help if you swam the English channel 40 years ago and haven't done anything since. But if you, if you keep renewing the passport with more marathons, it's an entree into just about everything. Yeah. Yep. So um, 2005, you did second one, successful attempt. What was next? Um, next... Um, Ooh, um, I don't have that up. list in front of me. I have, to, I, I, I have a list somewhere. That's Actually, okay, give, that's me a okay. sec, give me a second, I'll look it up. Oh, um, no, no, that's okay. We can, just, we can roll with no, it. No, 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 you asked a question. You, you didn't prepare me for this, this one, Shannon. You, you, you gave me some things you would ask, but not quite this one. Give me one second here. It wouldn't be that hard. Um, if you've got a goal like I've got, you've got to know you what they are by your... year. <laughs> So um, the next one was um, that six mile swim in Ireland off to uh -huh. an island called Inishboffin. I then swam 12 miles in Lake Champlain. Okay. So I back. was the first one to swim around the island of Cove, C-O-B-H in Ireland. It's about 26K. Uh, no one swam around it since. That was interesting. And then in, <laughs> in 2006, I went off to Santa Barbara to swim from Santa Rosa Island. I was supposed to go due north, but the winds were just howling. So I ended up going um, to the east. Uh, and um, if anybody's watched the movie Driven, um, I, uh, I was doing fine. And I got to a certain point and somebody said, it's one lap of Sandy Cove, which is about 900 right arm strokes. Put my head down, did my 900 arm strokes and moved about one inch. Uh, David Udevin, who's a Hall of Fame swimmer, who uh, was the last guy to do that swim 25 years earlier, he jumped in. I never had an escort swimmer before. I didn't really know what to expect, but I didn't expect him to start yelling that he would beat me to a pulp if I didn't start <laughs> moving my arms. We got, we got to the shore and I was fine. Um, I knew my name. It might have taken me a couple of minutes to tell anybody that. The two <laughs> red ambulances showed up. One of them took me to the ambulance, to the hospital. The other one took David, the kayaker, and the kayak out to the pier to meet the boat. 
and it's really a pity because it was a great scene in that uh, in that ambulance, which the young kayaker told me. He said there was an old ambulance guy and a young ambulance guy, and the old guy said, he goes, deja vu, he goes, I was lifeguarding out here 25 years ago when some guy died doing that swim. <laughs> David put his head down and raised his hand. <laughs> and if anybody remembers Lynn Cox's book, Swimming to Antarctica, he's in the forward of the book. So um, we both went to the same hospital. Uh, David, uh, I broke David's record and he, he, he wasn't overly pleased because um, um, he didn't finish the swim when he, for, when he started it the first time, he had completed it the second time. So that was my, uh, that was my hypothermia experience in the extreme. Yeah, yeah. Have you had any 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 like that? Any hypothermia experiences since then? I haven't gone to the hospital, um, but I've had hypothermic experiences. Um, I, I I think at this point I'm getting pretty good at understanding it as a swimmer. But again, it's it's I think it's the crew's responsibility foremost. So when I'm feeding every half an hour, you know I'm doing. 900, 1,000 right arm strokes in that period of time. If I'm at 600, I'm in trouble. In cold, fresh water, if my feet sink and when I turn my head, there ain't any air, I'm in trouble. If I can't stay next to the boat, I'm in trouble. And I've usually rehearsed it with the crew and mm -hmm. the crew have my instructions, which is they stop me and they say, if you can't swim straight at a good pace for the next 15 minutes, you're out. No. Yeah. Um, but I, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've had a number of experiences and, and I, at this point, while you're not supposed to monitor yourself for hypothermia because I count strokes, um, I have a pretty good idea. And by the way, if I can't count to a hundred anymore, it's a bad sign. Also, if I start counting like Jethro from the Beverly Hillbillies, you know, 9, 10, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, that's a bad sign too. Yeah. I don't think I can count to 100. I usually get lost halfway through and at, just on a regular, nice, warm pool day. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a skill to be able to count to 100. <laughs> takes focus. <clears throat> Tell us about a swim that you're the most proud of. So the, the swim I'm most proud of is uh, False Bay in 2012. I, I went down right before Christmas. I gave myself 9, 10, 11 days, whatever it was. False Bay is not a popular swim. It's, it's a bay south of Cape Town, 20 miles by 20 miles, or 34K by 34K. There, it's full of fish. They don't allow nets. Uh, there's an island kind of in the middle with a seal colony, so lots of young seal pups. And there used to be 200 great whites cruising around munching on seals. In the last year or so, it seems the orcas have scared the great whites out, but I'm sure it'll all be back. And it's the, the locals don't really do the swim. It's not popular with them. There's a whole group of professional shark spotters who call you the night before and go, we wouldn't recommend you do this swim. We saw a shark yesterday. And I'm going, well, you took a load of tourists out and threw blood in the water so you can see the great whites. Of course you saw sharks. But um, it, the reason I'm most proud of it is that um, uh, my head needed to be really good. And my head's never my strongest thing. Um, so you, I stopped watching the shark documentaries a couple of weeks before I went. And, you know, when something swims over the back of your legs, you got to be tough. When your arm hits something, you got to be tough. And then the, the, the craziest one for me is I was swimming along and the boat on the side of me all of a sudden stopped, cruised to the right urgently, and most of the people kind of fell down. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, the Seal Island isn't anywhere near us. There aren't any rocks. But if they had hit a 23-foot Great White, I reckon it might have had a similar experience. There was a, a bolt on the steering column that sheared. Um, and I remember at one point the guy came out, there was a shark shield on the boat, which is that wire that hangs out, whether it does anything, no one knows, but somebody <laughs> came out and tapped on it for a while anyway. <laughs> and they came back with a screwdriver and took it apart and took the batteries out. <laughs> then they came back in, put the batteries, new batteries in, I think, who knows, screwed it, <laughs> tapped on it again, shrugged their shoulders and walked away and you're going, okay, whatever. 
And then finally, like happens in many of these swims, it freshened up at the end, <laughs> which means you got that kind of big headwind and big waves against you. Normally, I'm kind of whimpering and crying towards the end. On this one, I was strong the entire time. There's only five of us who have ever completed the swim. Uh, the wow. swim was the idea of Kevin Murphy, the king of the English channel, and he didn't finish it. That was you, Kevin. You didn't finish it. So when I was done, I really wanted a shirt. Uh, but it would have been bold to just make a shirt. So I got a shirt made for my crew and all of the five, the other four people who'd ever made it. I'm actually wearing the shirt now. I don't know if you probably can't see this at all, but uh, uh, you won't be able to see it. And then I, I posted them off to a bunch of them to South Africa and they had a two month postal strike and like none of them arrived forever. Uh, but that was, that was my, uh, that was my proudest swim. There's very few people in the world that, uh, and say they swam false bay do you ever go back <laughs> I, I don't i don't tend to go back um and and i've got the eight repeat thing on <laughs> my goal go so it, it, it doesn't really help me um and my short <laughs> right. list uh, so my short places to swim. oh my short list of swims i want to do is about 300 and each year i end up doing something that isn't on my short i want to do list Mm -hmm. um, an example is uh, we had a young Indian swimmer named Shuban Van Mali who came to Cork Distance Week a few years ago. And uh, so a couple of years later, he sent me a mail. He said, look, he said, why don't you come to uh, Mumbai, uh, Bombay, for those of you with uh, gray hair, why don't you come to Mumbai and do a big swim here? So 24 hours later, I sent a message and said, yep. And then I asked the question, you know, by the way, what is the swim? And you swim into the very center of the city into some place called the Gateway of India, which is a big famous statue, sculpture, archway. And at one point during the swim, I think it's 32, 33, 35K, something like that. At one point in the swim, I think I maybe saw a glimpse of my shoulder. When I say the water is dark, trust me, the water is dark. And Mumbai wouldn't have the reputation as the cleanest water in the world. Um, right. <laughs> so I, uh, when I got out of the water, um, we, uh, we went and had some beers and had some street food and Shubhan <laughs> was quite upset because he had been deathly ill in his own hometown after he did the swim and I was fine. Oh no. <laughs> but I, I responded within 24 hours and said, yes. Yeah. Yeah. What, a, what fun, what fun to have do something like that. Um, what is, do you think, um, was the biggest learning you had from one of your swims? Um, the biggest learning was um, the, the Battle de Ronde in Vigo, Spain. Um, Shubham, uh, another Triple Crown swimmer, and I signed up for it, and we went. And it's in the north of Spain, it's on the Atlantic, and a lot of the Spanish swims are warm. This one wasn't going to be warm. And I, I think what I did, what I learned from it is normally I'm really particular about how I feed, what I feed on. I'm, I, if you five, 10 second feed and I'm gone. And this was going to be different because you were going to swim in a pack and you were going to feed off their feed boats, which were small. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a friend from Austria who was trying to get his special mix on these three feed boats and there were about a hundred swimmers and I was going, you know, yeah, so th th this is not going to work. So uh, Shubham and I started with 18 wetsuiters in a pack. Instead of feeding on my preferred 30 minutes, I think the first feed was about an hour, a very small boat with people doing a great job of throwing out uh, blue, orange, kind of chocolate, clear water, bananas, and a bit of orange peel or something. I don't know what they were throwing out. <laughs> so I, I got to the boat first because I, I didn't want to get kicked by a bunch of people in wetsuits. I drank and ate whatever they had. And then I swam around the boat to stay warm. The feed stop was about five minutes in water of 13, 14, 15 degrees. So chilly enough. Um, and um, my two triple crown colleagues didn't, didn't complete the swim. I completed the swim, mm. and, and I think the real lesson was I just thought of it as diving, and I'm not a diver, but 
you know, they, somebody gets off the diving board and they do a swan dive and they go, well, that's a degree of difficulty of one or something. And the next person gets up and does a, a triple front somersault in pike with three twists and that's a difficulty of five or something. And before Vigo, I said, the distance isn't the problem. The cold's probably okay, but the degree of difficulty is high. And you have to get mentally ready for the degree of difficulty, which is you just drink the orange or the blue stuff. You just drink it. Just drink it yeah. you, you don't, you don't mumble or complain or, you know, whatever. And if somebody throws you a banana, that's Brown, you eat it. You, know, you just, <laughs> you just don't mess with it. And then you thank everybody because they really did a great job. But that was, uh, that was the learning for me, which is you've got all of your things you want to do, but if you need to, you can change your entire routine. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a big one for people to learn. I was thinking back to what you were saying about being a water polo player and having a bunch of different kinds of strokes. Has your stroke evolved or changed at all over the course of your marathon swimming career? My, my stroke, um, I, I don't want to brag, but <laughs> coaches cry when they see me swim. <laughs> <laughs> they're not necessarily thinking Olympics. They're thinking more like, how does he actually manage to go anywhere? I have um, a left arm that flops out in front of me, um, barely clearing the water. And I have a right arm that could, um, could probably knock somebody out. There's almost no kick. Uh, my head is too high. I'm, I'm always looking under the water for jellyfish and it's not a pretty thing. However, um, you know, when I hit rougher water, I'm extending more and pulling more. Um, in smooth water, I can, I can pick up the pace. Um, so I have a number of strokes I use depending on the conditions I see. I don't think about them. They just happen. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that's probably similar for, for many people. And my stroke rate is typically about 64 wow. strokes per minute. Mm -hmm. um, if it's 50, I'm in trouble. And if it's 70, it's somebody else swimming, not me. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's 64. And, um, and that's, you know, that's, that's the stroke development. I, I did have a number of injuries a few years ago about when I was training for the channel, I, I had elbow and shoulder injuries. And what it was is I was training with people who actually knew how to swim. Mm -hmm. One of my training partners, Ronan Joyce, was the Ireland 100 meter champion he was about my speed over 10 miles, but he would do 31 strokes and I do 64 and they would do things like tie their ankles together and use paddles. And Ronan's <laughs> paddles were those, you know, if you remember those school dinner trays you used to have the big ones, Ronan's were he had two of those dinner trays with nails, a big nail stick through it. He'd just slap his hand down on it. And I, I could never swim with a paddle. So I would be, trying to keep up with this guy and I would get all sorts of injuries. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't done a butterfly, a breaststroke or a backstroke in 15 years and I've had no injuries. And, <laughs> yeah. and I don't, uh, I occasionally use little finger paddles, but almost never. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Uh, going back to your, um, your short list of your, what, what's a swim that you're looking forward to when you're, well, wait, let's, let's go back to, let's tell us about how the pandemic's been for you. Um, the, the pandemic has been um, horrible for everybody. Um, and let's, let's for the moment think that, you know, uh, you know people have died. Um, there are people terrified of dying. There are people locked in all over the world. So us prima donna swimmers, you know, whining about not being able to I swim. is travel. Pretty, yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty low on the list. Um, as the pandemic, before it was a pandemic, I was scheduled to swim in Cabo in March. So I flew to San Francisco. They locked down the South End Rowing Club after I was there for a couple of days. They're, they're still blaming me for that. <laughs> and then I headed down to Cabo. There were supposed to be 80 people going to a trip. Everybody canceled except me. Um, this was Scott Zoring's Cabo camp. I, I did the swim and then I moved my plane up a bit. I got the second last Irish airline from Los Angeles back to, to Ireland. Um, I think two months went by where I couldn't swim. Um, today we have a, a pretty serious situation again in Ireland. Um, and there are restrictions. You can't go more than 5k in the pursuit of exercise from where you live. 
Now, fortunately, Sandy Cove Island is three and a bit kilometers from where I live. So uh, while a lot of my friends can't swim, I've still got the ocean. It was at 1.2 kilometers. The ocean's about 200 meters that way. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a little marina. So when it was two kilometers, I would go sneak down to the marina and swim because no one was in their boat. So I've, I've, right. I managed to get uh, 1.1 million meters last year, but almost all of it was reasonably cold ocean swimming. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, so when you can travel again, what's something you're looking forward to? So I have so two, I have two, um, two big swims booked. Um, I uh, failed to uh, complete the Capri to Naples swim last year. It was supposed to be June when the days were a bit longer and it got moved to September. I did 34.7 K and got pulled before the 36 K end. They always told me it was 10 hours. I never thought I was that fast. So I was, I was, I was proud enough with the swim and I was, I was mostly proud that I handled being yanked with class. I thanked everybody. Um, the, the organizer was in near tears and I was going, you know, Luciano, come on, that was the deal, relax. Um, so I'm going back, hopefully June. And then um, I've also signed up for the swim around Atlantic City. I don't think anybody uh, over the age of 50 has ever done it. Uh, maybe 52. So I'll be uh, 64 or something like that, 63, whatever the number is. Um, yeah. There's a few challenges on the Atlantic City swim. So um, when you talk about different strokes, yeah. when you when you round the corner and the, and the current is dead against you, you better be able to sprint for a couple hundred meters. Um, mm -hmm. And you better be able to deal with whatever the ocean gives you and look up and not run into piers and things like that. So those are my two big swims scheduled for next year. Yeah. Um, isn't Char Charlotte Brynn did that one? Wasn't she over 50? She was, uh, she won the women's uh, yeah. year when she did it. And, and certainly I talked to Charlotte several times, including about a month ago before I signed up. Now on both of those swims, I've sent my money, but I haven't yet booked the flights or hotels. <laughs> right, right. Normally yeah, I would yeah. book everything on day one, but I'm going to wait yeah. on the hotels and flights. <laughs> and flights. Go back to the, um, the, um, the one in Italy, <laughs> I can't remember, Capoli to Napoli, was, it, was that it? Uh, Capri to Naples. <laughs> Capri to Naples, thank you. Um, so you were saying you only had 10 hours, you got pulled two, two kilometers from the end because of a time 1.3, 1.3. Okay, well, it was because of a time limit? The, the, the time limit's 10 hours and the reason there's a time limit is the boats don't have lights and they need mm. to get from the approximate finish back to their place while it's still light out. The days are relatively yeah. short in September and in the September, Harbor Master makes, makes the call. Got it, yeah, okay. And, and, and it was all, I always knew it was 10 hours and I was always looking at that going 3.6 kilometers an hour. I hope <laughs> either a big tsunami happens behind me or there's a massive current in my favor and neither of those happened. Right, right, oh, man, well, that was, that was a close one. Um, well, let's do, um, there's been a couple of questions coming in about Cork Distance Week. How did you, what, what was the idea for getting Cork Distance Week going? So for all sorts of strange reasons, I ended up co-founding the Santa Barbara Channel Swimming Association. I'd been there once in my life. And um, <laughs> we were, we, in 2005, we were bringing a group of 93 swimmers from Ireland to Alcatraz. And my co-founder, Emilio, signed me up for a Santa Barbara swim. I didn't know about it, but he signed me up. A, a bit like the guitar playing busker throws a few of his own coins in the basket and hopes it draws more attention. Uh, so I, uh, I went down and I told it, did the swim. Um, Emilio called me up uh, some months later and said, look, he said, we had this 15 year old kid who swam the 12 mile Anacapa swim. It's the most mature swimmer we've ever met, including you. And he said, I think we should put him on the board. <laughs> and I thought, you know something, these boards are comprised of a bunch of old people. Let's put a 15 year old on the board. He probably can't be a legal board member. And you got to get his parents to agree, but let's, let's do that. I was back in California anyways for business. So we had a board meeting, the Palfreys were on the board and they came from Australia for other reasons as well. Uh, the young man's uh, proud grandparents drove him to his first board meeting when he was 15. <laughs> his name is Nicholas Kane, by the way. And he, he just casually said to me, look, he said, 
I, I'm going to swim the English Channel next year, and my uh, I, my grandmother and I are coming over a month ahead of time to acclimatize. And I said, don't do that. You'll kill yourself. It's the most depressing place in the world to go and, and train. Why don't you come to Ireland for a couple of weeks? We're training anyways. I didn't think anything of it. Some months later, he sent me an email. He said, we've booked our flights. Looking forward to your two-week training thing. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> You're holding a camp. <laughs> oh, no. Faced with two options, which was tell them I was just being an idiot <laughs> or organize it. So I organized about 50 people. It was two weeks, wow. 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. every day because we were trying to work. Now, there was a six-hour swim in it. The six-hour was one of those days. It was 11 degrees. Wow. He was definitely not going to make it. And there was a there was a big guy, uh, Dan Martin, who was planning a round the world triathlon. So Dan decided he was going to take care of this kid who had now slowed down to be Dan's speed. I think at one point, Dan threatened to kill his grandmother. The kid tried to climb out at one point and Dan grabbed him by the skin on his back and pulled him back in. He was a skinny kid. And he did the, he did the six hour. It was really ugly. He went on to do the channel. He had a horrible day. And he, oh, he, he wrote something that said, look, finish the English channel. He goes, it was tough, but it wasn't nearly as tough as that six hour swim in Cork Ireland <laughs> in the cap. And I think we're now in our 11th or 12th year. We get about 80 people. Um, Caroline has been uh, twice, I think. Um, and um, we, uh, we, we do the six hour swim. We also have something called a torture swim, which is a little unusual. So normally we treat everybody pretty well. But for the torture swim, we do everything we can to break them mentally and physically. Because when you've missed Cap Grenet in France by 100 meters and the current has swept you away, there's nothing in your life that prepares you for that mentally. So we, we you know, we do all sorts of things. So I, I, we usually don't let people who like each other swim together. But these two guys were swimming so well together, English guy and an Irish guy. So I said, swim over there. And they said, where they said the horizon, swim to the horizon. So off they went. After about an hour, we went out and found him. Took us a while, and I gave the Irish guy his feed bottle with his mix, topped with a little bit of hot water. And I said to the English guy, "Five hundred years of crap you people have given us in Ireland. You get nothing." <laughs> and he just started laughing hilariously. He goes, "I knew you would try something like that." <laughs> <laughs> They, they both went on to complete the English Channel. Uh, but that's what we're looking for. When something happens in your swim, they've lost your feed, the, the propeller's caught in a rope, the, they're out of gas, whatever it is. You want the swimmer to go, well, at least Denison didn't do it on purpose. And you want them <laughs> to swim around in big circles and just have their head right. right. Uh, then we also have a triple crown dinner. Um, and I think last year or the year before we had 16 people who had done the triple crown and we, we have um, crowns made of Irish gold that we give people, maybe Irish plastic, but they're, they're gold. And uh, we have a formal <laughs> dinner for, I don't know, hundred people. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I did a couple of people sent questions in advance. Like um, how do you select people to go to the camp? Do you select people or people just apply or how does that work? Yeah, the camp is invitation only. Um, we, um, historically what happened was we, we, we had a list of people that kind of qualified and we opened it up and the first people got in for, I think it was as little as it's as $60 at one point, And the last person paid $1,500 <laughs> and the last person bought all of the food for the triple crown dinner, <laughs> all the caps, all the towels, whatever. And they were late signing up. And that was, that was their, their punishment. If they didn't want to come, they didn't want to come. I don't take any money or expenses or anything like that. So all the money, if there is a surplus, stays locally to do things. In the last couple of years, I've had people fill in small profiles. And what we found is that people that have a, a goal tend to work the camp a little harder than people that don't have a goal. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of veterans who just love to come and swim a couple hours a day and, and they're the life of the thing. So for 2021, we are scheduled for July. Um, we have about 95% of the slots are full. I held back about 5% for literally really interesting people or superstars that pop up at the last minute. 
I, I won't do the same sort of crazy pricing thing. <laughs> right. um, and uh, 2022, we've got about a quarter full because um, people couldn't travel last year. Some of them moved it to 2022. So right. we're, we, we've often sold it out a year, year and a half in advance. Wow. Yeah. Um, do you recommend it if someone's not great in cold water, do you recommend that they go to the camp or avoid the camp? <laughs> well, I, I think it depends on what your goal is. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're absolutely terrible in cold water, there are a thousand epic marathons that happen in warmer water. Right. Yeah. You don't have to swim the English Channel to be a big boy or big girl. Yeah. It, 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 it's one of the challenges. Yeah. Um, try yourself in Catalina first. It's often warmer, almost always warmer. Yeah. Um, but if you if you're a dead set for a North Channel and English Channel, you sure better find some cold water. Cork is almost always colder, but we've had a couple of years where we haven't made the 16 degree for the six hour swim. So, you know, you just, you don't know. Yeah. Yep. Um, Jesse Harowitz had asked me, how do you tell someone that they're not ready for the English channel? How do you diplomatically let them down easy? <laughs> I don't tell them that. You don't, you let them find out. No, I, I've, I've, I've seen, I've seen people do amazing things. So I don't tell them they can't. And, you know, you get 16 year old young uh, men and women from uh, young boys and girls from India who have never seen an ice cube, much less a uh, cold water. They come to Dover, acclimatize for a couple of weeks and swim the English Channel. Now, the pressure on them to complete the swim, it, it changes their entire life. Um, and I've seen people who have done almost no training go and do the English Channel. So I don't tell people they're not ready for, the, for a swim. What I can tell them is, I don't want them to come to Cork. Mm. They're not ready yet. And I give them a challenge. If you want to do the following X things and come back to me, fine. But for all sorts of safety reasons, I don't need you out there. Mm. Uh, but I, I never tell people they can't do it. I, I recommend what a sensible approach to it might be. Or when mm -hmm. they don't do it, I don't tell them they're crazy or an idiot, whatever. I tend to disengage quietly. <laughs> I don't disappear. I don't stop answering your questions, but I don't, I don't invest the same amount in a bad plan. Huh. Interesting. That's good, good advice. Shannon, um, you, you, you said you were going to ask me my favorite story and I've been practicing it all day. You've so been I'm practicing. You. I was just about to ask you your favorite story. It was like you read my mind. <laughs> so Tell us for about about your for, favorite, for, favorite swim memory. <laughs> for about 10 years, my goal was to swim from Devil's Island. Which is? Uh, Devil's Island is in French Guiana. It's north of Brazil, and it's part of France. It's not a colony. It's a county of France, like Alaska or Hawaii would be a state of the United States. It's part of France. And it's controlled by the French military. The European Space Station is there. And, you know, couldn't get organized, connected, didn't have it happen. And one of my uh, colleagues is Jacques Toussaint, who's now the king of the prison swims. He stole it from me. Uh, so Jacques is, is kind of a, a mafioso connected swimming Frenchman. He knows everybody. So Jacques found a guy with a boat, got permissions from everybody and their brother. And off we went to French Guiana. And this, uh, this is the movie Papillon, the book, uh, a penal colony off the coast. Uh, thousands of people died from yellow fever, malaria, and on the island, they, they had made a small swimming pool or dipping pool by you know, putting boulders in a, in a tiny little inlet, not even an inlet. And every day somebody would die, they put them in a burlap bag, they'd ring the bell, they'd throw the body in the ocean and the sharks would clean them up. Sharks being a bit like dogs, bell, dinner, and they got it. <laughs> so um, so we, off, off we go to start. It's Jacques and myself and a guy named Gilles, who's a a much younger fireman. You know, one of those guys that's on the weights every day. It looks like he's in incredible shape. Mm -hmm. So uh, off we go. And the plan is you got to swim hard for an hour. We'll stop after 30 minutes, very fast feet stop. We have to beat this current and then you can, you know, relax a bit. So we come in after 30 minutes and the young French guy is screaming at the boat captain mm -hmm. in French. Everybody's French except me. I don't have any idea what's going on. Screaming at the guy in French. The boat captain calmly reaches down, picks up this big, long stick with a bell on the end of it, and holds it in the air. 
Uh-oh. <laughs> well, I'm gone. I, I, I have never swum so hard laughing before in my entire life. I'm gone. The other guys are gone. And then uh, three quarters of the way through, the young French, the young French guy decided he would, he would show the old guys how to swim. And Jacques and I somehow found the gear. And when we, we finally made it to the beach. He just, the young French guy came out just going like, I can't believe you guys could swim that way at the end. Uh, but we think we were the first people to swim unassisted from Devil's Island. We didn't have a bag of coconuts. We didn't have a wetsuit, flippers or anything. And I still think, I still think it's probably one of the coolest iconic swims um, in the world. What, what's the distance, roughly? I, 14, 16, 18K. I, I don't even know. I, I have yeah. a chart somewhere, but. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. That sounds like a fun swim memory. If you have time, yeah, time for the, one the, more. The, give, me, the give me another one. <laughs> the bell, yeah. <laughs> the shark bell. <laughs> um, I, I'm as proud as I am of Swimming English Channel. I'm probably more proud that I went back. And mm -hmm. I'm also very proud of the fact that my 16 year old protege, Owen O'Keefe from Ireland, swam it. Um, and uh, it was one of those uh, end of September. We had three swimmers over there. The weather was terrible, 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 terrible. They're all in small caravans in, in Varn Ridge. And it was a very real chance they wouldn't swim. And we had uh, Lisa Cummings, who was planning an over and back, never having done an over and never really having done any epic marathons. Uh, Sylvain uh, Estadou from France, who was living in Cork. So Lisa took off on, um, I think it was Saturday morning or something, whatever time it was. Um, Sylvain took off on Sunday morning and we went down to watch them all from Shakespeare Beach. And then... Um, Owen had to start by one o'clock in the morning on the Monday or something, or he'd miss his window. So Owen starts and um, uh, Lisa made it. She, so she came in, we took her and her nearly broken arm, threw him off the boat, threw Owen off and uh, Lance Oram took off. And uh, dead, dead calm until we get right near the end. Um, and I did something which you probably never should do, but I know Owen really, really well. I had him stop and I said, pick up your pace by 10% and you'll be under 10 hours. Mm -hmm. And I said, you've got, I don't know, you know, 4K to do or something like that. I just made it up. And the current took him and it took him all the way that way and took him back along there. And he made the cap by inches. And every now and then I'd yell another number that was always smaller. 2200, <laughs> 1800. <laughs> And Owen got on the boat. His face showed no distress. He like he'd been in a 25 meter, you know, paddle around the pool. And he, he looked at me and he said, Ned, he goes, those were some of the longest meters I just swam. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, yeah, it's not, not fair to tell people the end of a swim. <laughs> to lie to oh, them it, as long as you keep the number getting smaller <laughs> and they believe you, it's okay. <laughs> But if you go 4K and the next thing you go 9K, that doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work, right? Just keep no, saying no. 3,900, 3, 3,800, even though they're going backwards. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Thank you so much for sharing your story today, Ned. It was really nice to have you on. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Hi, Chris. <laughs> take care, everyone. All right, you guys. Take care. Bye. See you next week. <clears throat>